High valuations mean low forward returns in an eventual bear market. But we haven't had that yet, right? We had a correction in 2022, but we haven't had a mean reverting event of any consequence. So not going to happen this time, right? Well, no, it just means that it hasn't happened yet. It doesn't mean that it's taken anything off the table. And this is going to be one of the Fed's biggest problems as they go forward because they're getting lulled into the sense of, of, of you know, economic certainty that, oh, we're going to avoid this recession. Take a look at the Fed's latest projections. Through 2026, they have no prediction of a negative economic growth environment at any point over the next right. five years. It's going to be it's going to be two percent ish, right? Not going to be too hot, not going to be too cold. It's Goldilocks and three bears. It's going to be just right, and no recession whatsoever. Even in their own forecast, no forecast recession. Maybe they'll be right. However, I do want to show uh, share this one chart with you because this is the the, the this whole 1995 soft landing analysis has a big flaw to it. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back at the end of yet another week here for a weekly market recap featuring my extremely sagacious friend, portfolio manager, Lance Roberts. Hey, Lance, how you doing? I'm doing great. Apparently, you've been playing with your small uh, small dinosaur again lately. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we got to keep people on their toes here at the beginning. Uh, sagacious, great word for you because you're a smart guy, and we're going to need that sagacity today to go through uh, all that's been happening. Um, I'm going to let folks in on on how we make the sausage here, Lance. You and I just talked for 40 minutes before I realized I did not have the record button on. And folks, I hate to say it, it was really, really good. So you're gonna, you're gonna get the, uh, the uh, expurgated uh, cliff notes here, folks, just the highlights of what we've talked about so far. Then hopefully we'll get to the, the new stuff we haven't yet talked about, Lance. But thank you for not just walking off in a huff with me <laughs> doing this. Okay, lots going on. We talked a ton about the new payroll numbers. We're just gonna have to hit the highlights here. Basically, uh, the uh, new payrolls numbers came out Friday morning. Uh, blew everybody away, way higher than than the forecast, more than twice what, what the uh, uh, consensus estimate was. I think we came in at 336,000 jobs. Um, rather than go through all the data, the sub data that I mentioned earlier, Lance, I'll, I'll, I'll just get to the punchline, which is um, this is a real head scratcher data for most analysts. Um, we've been seeing consumer spending, uh, its growth weaken. We've seen a lot of strikes going on. Um, none of that seems reflected uh, in, in the strength of these numbers. They even went back and revised July and August upwards here. Uh, if we look at some of the other uh, data reports that are being put out there, like by ADP and whatnot, those seem to tell a very different story than what the, these government BLS, BLS numbers uh, say. So I know we spent a good like 20 minutes railing against the weaknesses of the government job numbers here. Uh, what are the key takeaways you want the viewers to have here? What's going on with jobs? Well yeah, I mean, if you take, you know, the, the headline number is always the headline number. The, the the bottom line is if you look below the headline, the numbers aren't nearly um, what they seem to be. If you take a look at, again, let's just think about this logically for the moment. If you were hiring 335 or 350,000 people in a month, um, wages would be going up, right? Wages declined uh, on an average rate. So, that doesn't really make sense. You're seeing multiple part-time holders increase. Full-time employment is still lower than it was in 2019. So that makes no sense either. So again, you have to really take a lot of this data with a grain of salt. Uh, this is a random sampling survey. There's a lot of manipulation to the numbers. Um, but also remember that we are in a seasonal period of hiring where we hire a lot of temporary workers. Uh, for the holiday shopping season. And Halloween, if you didn't know this, is one of the, the second, it's the second largest consumer spending holiday of the year next to Christmas. It's even bigger than Thanksgiving. You, know, you think about, you know, all the 12 foot skeletons, the black cats, my wife's been decorating all week. So, you know, it's even bigger than back to school, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All think about think just about all the candy. I mean, you know, you know, if you if you're you know you buy a, a bag of candy to, to hand out to all the kids that come by, and six other bags are in your closet for later. Uh, so you know, <laughs> Reese's are a big big winner this time of year. So, uh, but that just goes to show you kind of what's going on, and so you got a lot of the seasonal data that's behind the scenes that doesn't really suggest that the employment number is nearly as strong as it looked. And, and look, the markets are going to see through that pretty quickly. 
And the initial knee-jerk reaction was a, a jump in yields and a sell-off in stocks because this means the Fed's higher for longer. The market's going to figure out the data's not nearly as strong as it is. Look, the Fed's not going to tell you they're done hiking rates because they can't. If the Fed told you they were done hiking rates, stocks would surge, bond yields would fall, and basically it would loosen monetary uh, monetary accommodation, which is exactly the opposite of what the Fed wants because surging asset prices makes consumers more confident. They spend more money in the economy because their, their 401ks are going up and that, that pushes on inflation. So that's not what the Fed wants. So the Fed's never going to tell you they're done. They're just going to stop talking about the need to hike rates any further. And, and then we'll just kind of figure it out from there. But they're done hiking rates at this point. So uh, the markets are going to figure that out in the next month or so. And, you know, and, and stocks will start to rally on expectations that we'll get back into that analysis that the Fed's done hiking rates. And the next thing is Fed rate cuts sometime next year. Uh, and that's good for stocks. It's completely backwards, but that's what the markets want. Yeah. Um, so when we spoke, when the recording was off, um, you know, you'd put on your conspiracy theory hat for a second and said, that you're going to let me you know, <laughs> potentially what might be going on here too, is the Fed is is whispering in the ear uh, of the, the, the BLS saying, hey, look, uh, I need really strong jobs numbers because I need the air cover to stay higher for longer. Right. And then I put on my conspiracy hat and, uh, you know, said and potentially whispering in the BLS's other ear is the administration saying, hey, we got to get reelected uh, right. in a year. So we need rosy job numbers, too. Right. Not necessarily saying that that's going on, although I got to feel there's some pressure on both sides, you know, applying here to the BLS for this. Um, but uh, who knows? Right. I mean, and, and then we had a nice long discussion about, like, can we even should we even really be looking at this this data anymore? The, the, the BLS data just seems to be so far afield from what a lot of the the much more um, close to a source uh, data sources that we look at uh, when, when they talk about jobs. And, you know, we basically said, well, look, we we, we don't have a hell of a lot of else to look at. So it's we got to look at something. But um, but it's yeah. a highly imperfect indicator. We'll put it that way. Yeah, and it, it is. And, and again, you know, it's it's if you're going to go shopping for cars, you got to look at something. Right. I mean, you can't go shopping an empty lot and try to figure out what you want to buy. So, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's hard to interrupt you because I want you to address this in your answer. But it. Yeah. How would you feel if the pilot of your plane was like, you know what, this altimeter is really wonky, but I got to look at something, right? You know, it's not confidence inspiring. Well, I don't know. It, no, it's it's right, and but but again, this is the the issue we have. You know, we have to have something to look at in order to to gauge, you know, kind of what earnings are going to be and what. Um, you know, kind of what the forecast is uh, for the markets and for the Fed. You know, they're trying to drive um, a ship by looking in the rearview mirror and taking a look at faulty data and then trying to make a decision about interest rates and monetary policy that about something that's going to happen in the future. And this is why they're always so wrong in their outlook for economic growth and for inflation and those type of things. And this is why they're always you know, too late to the party to start hiking rates. They're too late to the party to start cutting rates because the damage is already done. But you know, if you're gonna, if you're, if you're driving your car looking out the back window, this, you know, you're always going to wreck into something, and that's what the Fed is going to wind up doing again. But you know, even the Fed's got to have something to look at to make the. Now you think with 400 PhDs, they could come up with something better to look at than just you know government data. But uh, again, I guess you know, I'm not sure how smart. 400 PhDs are, I guess. I don't know. But well, it's crazy. It kind of seems a little suspect. Yeah. Again, back to your rant in the 40 minute version that I didn't record, um, where it's you, know, so good too. You, you said you know, we, we, we've got really simple ways in the modern era to look at real time jobs data, right? Yeah. To, to get a statistically significant sample and just look at what is literally happening in the jobs market. And to go back to my pilot analogy, yeah, it's sort of like, all right, your altimeter is wonky. So why don't you just look out the window? <laughs> right. That's way better than looking at a broken, a broken indicator. Uh, right. But for some reason, we are not doing. That. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. I mean, you think about all these payroll companies we have, you know, have ADP and paychecks that are doing real time processing of hiring and firing. Uh, you know, there's no better real time data. But, you know, we we get an ADP report, but even ADP kind of fudges with their data. It's like, just tell us what the data is. We'll figure it out from there. You don't need to do all these other adjustments back there. Just, hey. We hired 50,000 people this month. 
we fired 22,000 and we furloughed 10,000. We can work with that. Right? <laughs> you know, we don't need all this other stuff. But even the ADP report, nobody pays attention to it. It's, it's a secondary indicator to BLS, which is a, a survey of 60,000 people. So it's even less than what ADP has to work with. Um, but we don't even pay much attention. We go, oh yeah, ADP report is 89,000. What's the BLS going to say? Because that's what the Fed pays attention to. And you know, it's a shame because we have other, these other real-time economic indicators that are probably giving us much. The, the National Federation of Independent Business uh, surveys small businesses. Their hiring indicator is slowing down. Their wages are falling. Um, you know, Their sentiment optimism is declining pretty rapidly. Sales are deteriorating for these companies. They make up 50% of your employment in the country. So we don't pay attention to the NFIB. I write reports on the NFIB report when they come out because nobody pays attention to them. But that has a correlation to small cap and mid cap stocks. You should pay attention to it because they have a pulse on what's happening in the actual economy, that bottom chunk of the economy where the majority of people live. They have a good pulse of that and we just don't pay attention to it. <sighs> All right. Well, look, um, I, I think you just maybe gave the best reason for why we have to still look at the BLS data is because it's what the Fed uses, yep. right? Um, the, the, the you know, 800-pound gorilla, the Godzilla in a dunce cap. Uh, I think I used that term last week. Um, you know, we we might not re <laughs> we, we might not understand the decisions it makes. We might not respect the decisions it makes, but we have to respect the impact uh, that it has on the world and the destruction that it can leave behind when it makes bad decisions. So we, we got to look at the data, I guess, that it's looking at. Um, all right. So speaking of additional government data, um, the uh, inflation is measured by CPI. Uh, those new numbers will be coming out next week, next Thursday on the 12th, I believe. So when we meet again here for this video, Lance, we'll, we'll have that data. Um, if you could just prognosticate here, um, what do you think is going to happen with inflation? Is the next reading going to be higher, lower, or flat? It could be a little bit higher because you know we had energy prices uh, creeping up. And, and remember, so when we talk about CPI, this is a, a misnomer that a lot of people have about inflation. And you know, currently, you know, we're we're all you know complaining about four dollars a gallon of gasoline if you live in Texas. Now I know where you live in California, it's a lot higher, but. You know, we're like, oh, man, I'll be glad when this inflation goes away because my gas will get cheaper. No, it's not. And the reason and this is this is the big misconception. The Fed does not want deflation. Right. They don't want negative pricing in the economy. Prices falling in the economy or deflation is a psychological uh, cycle that is very difficult to break. Once you start getting deflationary pressures and prices are falling, Consumers, which make up 80%, 70% uh, of the economy on consumption, they go, well, I'll just wait because prices are getting cheaper. So I'll just wait as, as a car price is coming down or, or whatever it is. I'll just wait to buy it because it's getting cheaper. And that causes prices to get even cheaper because nobody's buying it. It's always supply versus demand, right? So what the Fed wants is they want inflation around 2%. So that means if, uh, if, if, um, gasoline was a dollar a gallon on January the 1st, they want it to be a dollar two January 1st of next year. They want it 2% higher. So again, your prices aren't going to go down. They're going to go up at a slower pace. And that's what the Fed is, is looking to do is bring that down. Now, again, a lot of this economic data that feeds into inflation runs in a lag. Homeowners equivalent rent makes up over 30% of the index. Energy and a lot of people are looking at energy lately going, oh, inflation's about to go surging off to the moon because oil prices are going to $150 a barrel. And I, I think you and I last week were talking about energy prices saying, hey, look, they're super overbought. You're going to have a correction. And we've had a very nice correction now in oil prices. Uh, that's just because of economic demand. Gasoline demand is falling sharply. And that's another good indicator that suggests, by the way, that this employment number isn't nearly as strong as people expect because right. of it was strong gasoline prices, I mean, gasoline demand wouldn't be plunging off the cliff in a single month. So again, there's a lot of things behind the scenes, but that decline in gasoline isn't going to show up until a couple of months from now in CPI because it runs in a lag. And oil prices have nothing specifically directly to do with a CPI inflation calculation. So when you're looking at the CPI calculation, energy makes up 7% of CPI, but that's gasoline. That's 
home heating costs, home cooling costs, utilities, there's no input there for oil prices. It's all the byproduct of oil prices. So yes, there's indirect effect of higher oil prices, but what happens to the prices of the byproduct is what's more important. So that big drop in gasoline is going to be a deflationary impact, or I should say the correct term, disinflationary impact to CPI in a couple of months. So long, long answer to get to the point that we might see a little bit higher CPI, a little hotter CPI uh, at this next read. But I would expect that to, to go back to its more kind of 2.2% trend, um, you know, in November and December. Okay. All right. Um, so Lance, we're, we're finally catching up to kind of near where we were when we realized that I didn't have the record <laughs> button on. Um, but I, I wanted I want to ask the same question I asked you earlier, um, which is, okay, let's zoom way back for a minute. Okay. okay. So 2019, end of 2019, if I had talked to my network of contacts, just people I know, and told them, hey, everybody, your cost of living in your key essentials, right? Your food, your fuel, your shelter, your healthcare, you know, whatever, the things that really matter, forget about luxuries for a second. That's all gonna go up by like 35% or more over the next couple of years, right? Um, Cause what, you, what, what you're saying, and we talked more about this again when, when, when the recording was off, um, <laughs> The Fed is playing for disinflation, meaning it wants to bring inflation, the inflation rate down to its 2% target. It is not playing for deflation, meaning lower prices ahead, right? So it's just trying to get to a more stable baseline uh, for price stability, right? Of prices, meaning th these big increases that we've seen over the past couple of years are not going to be rolled back, right? For folks that are sitting there hoping, oh, okay, well, hopefully we'll, once all the dust settles, you know, things will become affordable again. That's not the Fed's plan, right? And so if indeed we are just now at a higher cost of living, like I said, back in 2019, if I had asked my network of contacts then, I don't know very many who would have said, oh, all right, I'll be fine then. I know a ton who would have said, then it's game over for me. Like, I don't have the ability to absorb that into, into my current lifestyle, right? So um, help help me just understand this right we, we we've had that what apparent, apparently seems to be permanent substantial leap in cost of living how can we absorb that over time without just some sort of mathematical adjustment like we just have to spend like like the economic spending is going to have to drop because people just don't have you know the the wherewithal that they did back at the end of 2019 Right. And, and, Back then, we could have talked about surveys where 60% of households couldn't come up with 400 bucks in an emergency, right? I mean, there were a lot of people were really tight back then. So when, when does the reckoning of this happen or will there not be one? Well, you know, this is the soft landing, no landing scenario conversation. And, uh, and that's something I do want to talk about here real quick as well, because I think it's an important factor. Um, but again, you have to go back and ask that same question. So yeah, let's let's go back and ask Bob in, in 2019. Say, hey, Bob, I know you're living paycheck to paycheck pretty much right now. You don't have $400 in the bank. But over the next you know, year or so, your costs are going to go up 35%. And he's going to go, well, I can't afford that. It's like, okay, well, what if I give you a whole bunch of money to help you out? And he's like, okay, well, that's fine. Then I can do that. And that's what we did, right? We, we raised the cost, but we gave people money. Well, a lot of those benefits are just now starting to roll off. You know, kind of roll off. Uh, you know, we just started people back on student loan payments. As of the end of December, we still had extended child tax credits and other stuff in the system that was helping people out. Um, you know, we had all the checks sent directly to households before that that, that increased savings and reduced some debt. We, you know, people did actually pay off some credit card debt with some of those stimulus checks, which was good, but they've been ramping the credit card debt back up. So that's been giving them some, some runway to sustain this higher cost of living, but we're getting towards the end of that runway. But here's the interesting thing, right? So in, 29, so in 2022, last year, you know, we had the inverted yield curve and everybody's like, oh, well, we're gonna have a recession. You know, you and I were having these conversations. Everybody was coming on your channel. Oh, recession's coming, definitely gonna have a recession. And we didn't get one, right? And, and, and we had this inverted yield curve. And well, apparently it's wrong this time that we've got an inverted yield curve. And now everybody's talking about this soft landing in 1995, right? We're gonna have a soft landing. Since we didn't have a recession already, 
obviously we're having a soft landing. The Fed has done it. They have engineered a soft landing scenario. But the question you've really got to ask yourself is, is one, have they? And, and this is, this is the, the big conundrum. And this is where we always tend to get things wrong because we assume that just because something hasn't happened yet, that it won't. High valuations mean low forward returns in an eventual bear market. But we haven't had that yet, right? We had a correction in 2022, but we haven't had a mean reverting event of any consequence. So not going to happen this time, right? Well, no, it just means that it hasn't happened yet. It doesn't mean that it's taken anything off the table. And this is going to be one of the Fed's biggest problems as they go forward because they're getting lulled into the sense of, of, of you know, economic certainty that, oh, we're going to avoid this recession. Take a look at the Fed's latest projections. Through 2026, they have no prediction of a negative economic growth environment at any point over the next right. five years. It's going to be it's going to be two percent ish, right? Not going to be too hot, not going to be too cold. It's Goldilocks and three bears. It's going to be just right, and no recession whatsoever. Even in their own forecast, no forecast of recession. Maybe they'll be right. However, I do want to show uh, share this one chart with you because this is the, the the this whole 1995 soft landing analysis has a big flaw to it, and and, and so let me share my screen here, and I, I want to show you this chart. So. Uh, actually, let me jump forward one chart. So I want to, this chart right here will explain the previous chart a little better than I'll go back to that one. So we often talk about inverted yield curves. And, you know, most of the time we focus on the 10 year versus the two year. We say, okay, here's the 10 year, two year. And, and you know, that's what matters because every time we've had that, that's always signaled a recession. And that's a true statement, by the way. Great. But hey, Lance, we, just, just hit the zoom a little bit more. We, we, we got a lot of boomers that watch this. They really appreciate the bigger charts. Is that big enough? That's big I'm, enough. I'm a boomer too, so I'm, I'm kind of squinting at it. So there. You know. <laughs> um, but this this chart goes back to 1970, uh, 1977, and we track in our office ten different. These are now these are just the yield curves we pick. Um, these are the ones that we feel are most economically important because it, it kind of hits different levels of borrowing at different stages. And so importantly, as we've talked about before, the Fed controls the short end. So whatever happens on two years or less, uh, that's all Fed control. On the long end of the curve, the, the five year, the 10 year, the 20 year, that's all economics. That's inflation, that's economic growth, that's wages and that's savings. So that's all economics on that far end. So on the, on the short end of the curve, that's your credit card debt, that's your variable loan rates, your adjustable mortgages, you know, all those things that are tied to really short-term rates. On the long end are your mortgages, uh, longer auto loans, you know, those type of things. That's all controlled by the longer end. So these different yield curves, um, and we track 10 of them because they, they affect different areas of the credit markets across the economic cycle. Again, what's an inverted yield curve? All that means is, is you've got one yield that's very short that is out of balance with a, a one that's of a longer duration. So as an example, the two-year interest rate is higher than the 10-year interest rate. And that shouldn't be the case because what that says is that if you're borrowing money for two years, you're paying more in interest than borrowing money for 10 years. That doesn't make sense because of just the, the time. If I've got a loan out for 10 years, I should be paid more for that than just loaning money for two years, just for time. Not right. mentioning inflation and economic impacts and opportunity costs and all the other things. So it's not. So what that says is, is that in the economy, nobody wants to lend long term. They're willing to give you some money short term, but they're not wanting to really loan you money long term. And so there's this economic imbalance that's going on. And that's what's happening. So these 10 yield curves tell us a lot about the economy. And what you'll notice is, and, and you know, people will say, well, the only yield curve that matters is the 10 year and the three month or the 10 year and the two year. What you'll notice is, is that when all 10 of these yield curves, or at least the vast majority of them, say 70, 80, 90, 100% of them are inverted, you've always had a recession. But right. importantly, always. it's not the inversion. If you'll notice on this chart, when the inversions occur, you don't have a recession. It's when they uninvert. That is the recognition of the incession, recession. In other words, everything that was being done, I don't want to loan long end, I want to loan short end, all of a sudden it breaks and everything goes in the other direction. And that's because of the onset of the recession. So it's when these uninversions occur on a rapid basis that the recession is recognizable. Now, let me, let me, now, so 
I needed to give you that basis and I apologize a little long, but that explains this chart. So this chart, the blue lines are the percentage of yield of those 10 yield curves, how many of them are inverted, okay? And what we want to know is, and right now, if you take a look at this chart, 90% of the yield curves are inverted. Whenever you've had more than 50% inverted, you've always had a recession. So let's go back in time for just a moment and let's look at uh, 2006, 2007, 2008. So in 2005, we were getting inverted yield curves, but we didn't have more than 50% inverted. So people were talking about, oh, we have an inverted yield curve, but we don't have a recession. So it's a Goldilocks economy, Ben Bernanke, right? Subprimes contained, it's a Goldilocks economy. Everything is fine. Then we went to 60, 70, 80% inversions in 2007. And then in 2008, they started to uninvert and you had the recession. Go back to 2000, right? In, in 1998, we saw a, a bit of an inversion occurring, but we never got to 50% inversion. We only got to 40%. And then the, the then we uninverted the yield curve. And then in 1999, Alan Greenspan started hiking rates. He was af afraid of this inflation boogie monster, that inflation was about to rear its head and destroy the economy. So we started hiking rates. We inverted 100% of the yield curves over uh, over that short period heading into 2000, and then ultimately had the recession in 2001. But I want you to take a look beyond a little bit back. So everybody's talking now about 1995. 1995, the Fed was hiking rates, but we didn't have a recession, and we had this soft landing in the economy. But if you take a look at the chart, we never even had a hint of a recession of an inverted yield curve in 1995, 1996, 1997. We had no inversion of any of the yield curves during that period. The economy was doing fine. Yes, the Fed was hiking rates. We had long-term capital management blow up. We had Asian contagion. We had the Russian debt default. We had a lot of other impacts from the Fed hiking rates. But there was a, a, a quote unquote soft landing because none of the yield curves were inverted. We have, a, we have 90% of yield curves as of today inverted. And people are saying, oh, we're going to have a soft landing. This is not 1995 from an economic standpoint, much less the amount of debt that we have in the system. But there is a vastly different economic backdrop of the yield curve inversions today versus 1995. And, and again, previously, any period prior to this, when you've had more than 50%, you can see back in 1998, we were inverting it. 1990, we had 60% inverted. 1991, we have a recession. All through history, anytime you've had more than 50% inverted, you've had a recession. So expecting this time to be different is probably a pretty far stretch for both the Fed and, and, and for the kind of mainstream media people in general. Okay. Um, really good, detailed answer to my question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask it one one slightly different way, and then we're gonna we're gonna move on to all the other questions that I got here. Um, <laughs> so you just made a really good case for why you got to have a really strong argument that it's different this time for us not to have a recession coming, right? right. Um, and I mean, showing my cards, yes, I think that's the the likely probability here is that there's there's a recession coming. It's probably going to be even worse than if we had let it happen at, at the beginning of this year. Uh, because every time you kick the can and you just try to extend and pretend you're you're building up that that the damaging force of the kinetic energy of, of the eventual correction. Um, but that's, you know, business cycle, you go from boom to bust, right? I, I, I'm more, I just want to get back to the question of like, we just dialed up the cost of living on America <laughs> by and I'm pulling this number out of my my ear, so I don't know if it's the right number, but I think it's in the right ballpark. 35% in three years, you know, you maybe know. more for certain things, but maybe let's say on average 35%. Yeah, that might send us into a recession, but 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 that's not a cyclical thing, right? It, it, unless there's some growth miracle at some point in time that that suddenly increases wages by 35% in, in three years, right? To me, that feels like a permanent weight on... Uh, you know, on the economy, on the populace. Um, am I thinking about this wrong or, or do you no, that's that, no, that's absolutely right. So the whole premise of the soft landing, right, is that the economy can withstand higher rates. 
and higher inflation and keep chugging along. And so you don't have this recession. You, you've got increasing wages and increasing employment and, and consumption is still going and all those type of things. That's going to be, a, it, it, could that happen? Absolutely. The, the question you've got to ask yourself, though, is what is going to be the driver for stronger economic growth? I, again, economic growth is 70% driven by consumption. So without more stimulus, without more checks to households, without zero student debt payments, without extended child tax credits, without extended unemployment benefits, without all the other supports that we, oh, and without another Inflation Reduction Act, we can't forget that, that was a lot of spending. Um, so without that, what is gonna be the next driver for more economic growth to offset the impact of higher rates and higher inflation on the economy? And, and, and I don't have the answer to that because I guess the government could come, the Biden administration tomorrow or the next administration, we've got an election next year. So whoever gets elected, you know, in uh, 2024, they come in and say, first order of business, five trillion into the economy, direct checks to backs to households. That's going to, that, that would offset a recession, right? It would create a bunch of inflation again. But right. that would <laughs> it's not the problem. Um, so, so again, you can't, you know, this is always the problem with predicting the future is that we have to base, you know, our predictions of the future based on some logical evidence of what's going on. And, uh, and historically this has happened when, when the economy has been this way, but certainly things can, can be different this time. You know, one, one of the, the interesting conundrums this time around has been net interest expense for corporations has not really risen along with the rise in interest rates. And that was because all these big mega companies were financing debt at zero rates and they haven't had to do new borrowings. Right. Now, That's a ticking year, time bomb, as we've talked about. Yeah. Right. Well, next year, uh, in 2024, we've got a huge debt wall for small and mid-cap companies. They're going to have to refinance. But that's not the Apples and the Microsofts of the world. They're fine. Uh, they've got a ton of capital and, and uh, sitting in, in treasuries and in money markets that they don't need loans. So they don't need to borrow at these higher rates. So, But that, that lower net interest expense is allowing corporations to gen out higher profitability than we would have expected otherwise at this point in the game. So again, there's things that can certainly offset the bearish case in the short term. And, but I think we have to be aware of that bearish case because there is there is certainly a case to be made for that more bearish outlook as we get further into 2024. Is And, and is that the right year? I mean, is it 2025? Could it go out further than we expect? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely possible that this drags on a little bit longer than we expect. But I think at some point that bit more of a bearish forecast you know, starts to to have real quote unquote teeth, um, you know, in the market environment. Okay. All right. Well, my, my last point on this is just, you know, I think we've made a permanent, we put a permanent burden on, on the economy by raising cost of living for, for consumers the way they are. So whatever growth was going to be right. Um, you know, there's 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 a heavier weight now um, on the consumer spending side of the equation um, that can get addressed by all the mouse click money and magic that you just talked about, but all of that comes at a cost too. So it's just that, that that's my big concern here. Now, yeah. to your point, I mean, yes, we can go into recession, um, in you know, probably likely to happen. One thing though, so I interviewed Ed uh, Yardeni. Um, who does a really good job, I will say, of, of you know, countering, delivering a counter argument for, for a lot of the bear issues here. Now, he, he's he's got a lot of the same macro concerns, so it's not like he's a total Pollyanna. Um, but one thing I want to mention that, that he brought up that I think is important for us bears to or, or for bears to keep in mind here, which is um, with this higher cost of capital that's come with with higher debt yields and whatnot. Right. And all the all the concerns that we have around that. Um, he says, you got to remember that like the, the trillion dollars that the government's going to spend this year in debt service, right? Is like, you know, there's a good chunk of those, that, that debt, the, the, those debt payments that are going back to investors of the people that have taken their money out of banks and put it in money market funds and, and treasuries. And so there's actually a lot of investors that are getting a really nice cash flow right now that is enabling them to continue to spend and consume. So that's something that can keep this going longer. It's really kind of a form of stimulus, 
right? Yeah. So um, I want, let, me, let me let me counter that argument real quick. I'll let you counter that. Let me just mention one point in case you want to address it in your answer, which is um, th there is a lot of unfairness in that, though. In other words, you know, that's not a stimulus that's going to equally to all Americans. It's Very going to those households that have that own financial assets, right? So now, granted, those t those people spend more on a per capita basis. So again, it can keep the economy more supported, but it is it is not fair at all. And it, it exacerbates the, the wealth gap that you and I have, have railed about for so often. So anyways, go ahead. No, that, that was my point is that, you know, it's that's, you know, yes, there's a lot of households that have treasuries that are clipping into higher interest coupons, um, but that's about 10% of the economy. Um, the other 90% are living paycheck to paycheck. They don't have money invested in bonds. Uh, they don't have money in savings. And again, we take a look at the economy being broken down, you know, 70% of its consumption, you know, 10% of the population is not making up 70% of the consumption. So, you know, it's, you know, it's, they, they, they do consume at higher levels. So in other yeah, words, they spend, they spend above their weight though, right? I think the top 20% yeah. does like 40% of the consumer spending or something like that. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's definitely up there. Um, but, you know, that doesn't con completely offset the drag that you see from the bottom 80% of consumers. It's also like, you know, a lot of people talk about GDP, which has a component of business investment um, in the GDP calculations. They say, well, businesses are spending more money, so that's gonna help the economy grow, but not if 70% of the, of the GDP report is, is consumption. If that's slowing down, that little 15% is not gonna make up the, the slack, right? So it's always important to you, and, the, the, and I'm glad you made the point, which is, You've got to understand that that's not equal in the economy, and the, and that anchor of that bottom eighty percent does matter. It, it, it does matter. I, I guess my only point there is just um, I think we look a lot at the anchor of oh gosh, you know, a higher cost of living, higher interest rates that's killing the consumer, but it is rewarding a part of the consumer right. piece as well that 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 lightens the load a little bit, right? In other words, it's just it's it's another factor that could push things off a little bit further. Than, than folks might imagine just by looking at the cost of debt alone. Um, so, and I'm talking fast because I got a lot of points I want to make here, but so Ed, like you, Lance, probably even more so than you, um, believes that stocks are, are more than likely going to rally into year end. I think he's got a 4,600 target on the S&P right now. Um, and when I was interviewing him, um, I did mention uh, a number of the other people that have a similar forecast that I've talked to on this channel so far. So Darius Dale, I think he's got a 4,600 uh, forecast for the end of the year as well. Uh, Sven Henrik thinks more than likely stocks are, are, are going to end the year higher. Uh, I know you do. I had uh, Thomas Thornton uh, on the channel uh, earlier this week, has a similar outlook. Um, again, folks, nobody knows what's going to happen here, but you know, Earlier this week and late last week, as folks were really beginning to freak out about the higher bond yields, um, you know, seen a lot of people who are saying, OK, this is it. This is where it all rolls over here. Right. And I just want to make sure that if folks are making that bearish outlook, their primary thesis, uh, it's fine. But just make sure that you are you are positioning your portfolio such that if you're wrong <laughs> and, and, and these other people are right and stocks actually, you know, pick themselves up and, and end up finishing the year pretty strong, you're not going to take losses so severe that it really impairs your, your future ability to, to grow your portfolio. Yeah, no, I think that's an important point because uh, after last week's interview with you, I got a bunch of people, you know, you posted on Twitter, um, which feeds into my channel. And, and so I see the comments coming from it. And so that a lot of people are like, Lance is, Lance is uber bullish. And, you know, when he'll be bullish when stock, when the index is at 2,400, I'm like, you don't listen at all, do you, as to what I'm saying? I'm not bullish or bearish. I'm just simply what the markets are telling me right now. My target for the end of the year is 4,500. Um, we've got a downside target of 4,000 right now. Um, if we break 4,200, we're going to start reducing risk in the portfolio. So, sorry, uh, 4,100, we'll start reducing risk in the portfolio. Um, you know, that's just portfolio management. So there's a point that, you know, we've been using this decline in the market over the last month or so to add exposure based on our thesis for a year-end rally, because markets are deeply oversold, sentiment's gotten very negative now. Um, you've got a very high put-call ratio, which suggests that people are just, you know, completely on the wrong side of the chart. <clears throat> They're too bearish. Um, so, hey, so sorry to interrupt, while you're doing your litany, do you mind pulling up the, the chart of the S&P that you pull up every week, just so we can map to where we are right now? Sure. Um, 
So now you broke my completely broke my train of thought, but <laughs> give me a second. No, I'm sorry, but you, you were basically saying, look, you know, markets yeah, yeah, yeah. sold in the short term. I just just lots of reasons to say, you know, there's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of negative sentiment. Well, I'm, just, out there. I'm, just teasing, up. I'm just teasing you. I'm okay. just, you're, you're like my wife, always interrupting me right in the middle of a good thought. Uh, <laughs> and I don't get them that well, often. I'm, I don't get good thoughts that often. So, you know, give it, give it to me when I got it. I'm, I'm uh, your internet wife. I like that. Exactly. So, um, so here's the chart of the S&P. Again, you know, take a look at the top chart indicator. That's our relative strength index. That Those little red dots um, are when the markets are oversold. And, you know, if we go back in time, whenever the market has been this oversold on a relative basis, you always get uh, at least a reflex of rally in the market. So the reason I've got 4,500 kind of pegged, it's going to be about uh, kind of in this range, 4,400, 4,500 is about where, you know, we're going to run into resistance at the 50 and the 100 day moving average. Uh, we get through that. And which is very likely if we're getting a strong rally put together, 4,600 um, is basically pushing the, the highs for the year. So uh, the highs for the year, certainly within the, the realm of reality, I'm a little bit more along the line that we're going to this kind of downtrend that we're starting to form here. We had a, low, a higher high in July, a lower high in, in uh, you know, in October. And so if you kind of draw a little line here, about 4,500 is where the next lower high would be. So if we are putting in a series of lower highs, and that's why that's my initial target at 4,500, that's about where I expect the market to kind of peter out a little bit. And again, it'll depend on, you know, if we're at, by the time we get there, if we're back to overbought conditions, again, if you take a look at this top indicator as well, whenever you're above 70 or close to it, that's basically been a peak in the market. So that's a good time to take money off the table. And again, this is why I'm not bullish or bearish. You know, we were talking about you and I uh, back in June and July, hey, we're going to have a three to a five to a 10% correction in the markets. We're reducing risk. We took some money off the table. We're hedging the portfolio, blah, blah, blah. Um, that's what we talked about back then. So now we've had this correction. And I told you when this correction came, what was going to happen? All the bears were going to come out saying, see, it was a it was it was a it was a bear market rally. Now it's over. And and they're coming out, right? I just got an article posted this week, you know, uh, from a, another advisor it came out says the bear market rally's over, right? The bull, the bear market's back, maybe. But again, if we take a look at our MACD indicator at the bottom, which is our buy sell indicator, it's very, getting very close here to triggering a buy signal. Uh, the market's having a very nice rally on Friday um, based off that employment number, bounced right off the 200 day moving average, which was a perfect retracement from that high. So we had a 38.2, that's a Fibonacci retracement. Don't worry about it, it's technical mumbo jumbo. But basically, we had a, a perfect retracement of an initial Fibonacci retracement scale that sets that, that technical price move now back for that rally. So again, we get a rally here in stocks. Um, if we start to see some weaker economic data, that's gonna boost the rally even more because that means the Fed's gonna be closer to you know, cutting rates than hiking rates. Uh, so there's a lot of backdrop here that suggests that we could see a fairly decent rally into year end. Now, again, don't come at me and say, oh, you're uber bullish. I'm not. I was just talking about when we get into next year, it's game over. Uh, not, I don't want to say game over because it's never game over, but it's, it's a different <laughs> game going into next year because once we get into next year, we are going to have to deal with slower economic growth, uh, the, the potential for an economic recession in the last half of next year, um, over, overly high valuations and earnings estimates relative to what reality is going to turn out to be. So estimates are going to have to come down that's going to weigh on prices. Now, it doesn't mean the markets are going to collapse and we're going to have a 50% decline, but it does suggest that we could have, you know, another kind of tough year next year, treading water back and forth and, and, and really kind of having difficulty finding some footing for the markets. Again, just a, a sloppy year, not necessarily an end of the world type event. And I do want to show you one other thing here uh, just very quickly because we do- Actually, can, can I ask a question before you, two questions before you hop off this chart? No, at least you didn't interrupt me that time. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So uh, first off, I just want to I, I want to emphasize why we do this, right? Why we keep bringing this chart up here. Yep. Um, well, you just left the chart I was going to comment on, buddy. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I go back. Hold on. Okay. Um, but you know, to your point, like we were we were talking to that chart back at the end of July, right? When it was very overextended or looking very overextended. And saying, hey, uh, you know, 
you were saying, look, it looks like we're going to have anywhere from a three to 10% correction, right? right. Um, and and, and that, that is how it played out, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, looking at the technicals are not the entire story by any stretch, but they do give us, you know, some good uh, indicators to be able to sort of develop some probabilities of what's likely to happen, you know, in the relatively near future. Um, uh, I, hopefully you're bringing the chart up here because I'm going to speak to it. I'm trying to, and now I'm having technical difficulties. So give me just a second. Okay, no worries. Um, but but basically, uh, and I'll speak from memory here, we have the uh, your RSI indicators and your your MACD indicators, you know, which which were plunging over the past couple of weeks. And you were saying, look, you know, they look like they're getting close to a period where they're going to be so oversold that we would expect them to, you know, to reverse basically. Yeah, so exactly. So now we've actually seen what appears to be, appears to be the reversal in both of those, right? So highlighted in the little pink circle for both of those, right? Right. Um, Also, as we got closer and closer to the the red line in the main chart there, which is the 200 day moving average, you said, look, that's for what we know right now, that's support. And, you know, if, if it gets down there, it's likely to bounce off that support line. Again, exactly what's happened here. So we're just we're seeing all the indicators that we would expect to see from hitting an oversold maximum to beginning to revert back to something that's less oversold. Right. Um, and and the, the, the jump we saw in the markets today. Yes, maybe it was triggered by the news of the jobs report. But also you could just sort of say the system was waiting for a trigger because it was everything was was, was in line, right? Uh, sounds like you're just saying yes, Adam, but feel free to comment on any of that. My other question for you is, okay, let's say instead of the expected uh, reversion here, it was to reverse and puncture through the 200 day moving average. How would that change your outlook? Well, then I would change this from, from bullish to more bearish near term. We would have to reduce exposure in the portfolio, say, hey, you know, these positions we added on over the last couple of weeks, hey, we were wrong. That happens. Uh, we're going to sell those positions, raise some cash, probably add to our bond portfolio at that point, because if markets are going to be declining sharply, money's going to flow into treasuries for yield. Um, and, you know, you'd be looking at somewhere uh, around probably 3,800 to 4,000 for your next kind of short term bottom in the markets. Um you know, I doubt we get down to, you know, 30, you know, kind of the October lows. That's probably not going to happen right now. The data doesn't really support that. But, you know, that's certainly not out of the cards for next year if we start to see a recession pick up. OK. All right. So, you know, so I just want to say, folks, this is why we do this, right? This helps us sort of track where we are. It helps us have a sense of where things may go next. Um, but it also helps us sort of see key turning points in market sentiment. So to your point, Lance, if we punctured below the 200-day moving average, there's a lot of people who are watching the same data who would have to say, oh, geez, I was wrong, right? Yeah. And, and, and now all of a sudden this thing I, I was had some confidence was a floor. Geez, maybe that's a ceiling now and we got to we gotta reassess, you know, where this could go. And then, like you said, you know, maybe everyone starts looking at 3,800. Um, so anyways, we'll keep tracking this going forward, folks. All right. Sorry, interrupted. Your, your yeah. Let me, let me just say one thing. You know, and and yeah. again, this is this is really key to what you're you're kind of talking about. See, the problem with most investors is is they get into a bias mode, and they're like, okay, stock prices are going up, so they can only go up from here. And so that was that. So let's look at this chart one more time. So if we look back in in 2021 and and heading into 2022, it was clear stocks could only go up. But even along the way of stocks going up, there were regular corrections along the way because stocks can't just go inexorably higher. They have to have some relationship to kind of economic realities, et cetera. So when everybody gets on one side of the boat, everybody's long stocks, then all all that has to happen in the markets. And remember, all the markets are is a market, right? You got buyers and you got sellers. Well, if everybody has bought right? There's nobody left to buy anything. So if one guy says, hey, I want to sell, then all of a sudden, you all these other people go, oh, I got to sell too. And so you get these, these what we call buying and selling stampedes. And uh, let me, if I zoom in here, let me zoom in a little bit so it's a little clearer to see. But you'll notice that during any period we get into, and this is the, the kind of the correction we had last year, but even during that, that bear market, everybody's like, oh, stocks are just going to go down from here. 
fantastic tradable rallies to work off of. And that's because you get this selling stampede. And these selling stampedes tend to last anywhere from 15 to about 21 trading days, give or take. Some are longer, some are shorter. And then you get the inverse of that, which is what we call a buying stampede. And everybody for 15 to 21 days are, is going to buy stocks because now it's like, oh, okay, well, there's this new narrative and it's going to go. And then that narrative fades and we get, and we just, we just ebb and flow from these buying stampedes to these selling stampedes. And that's what the relative strength index at the top of the chart tells you. And it's a really simple indicator. And when you're at 70, this is where guaranteed, right? When you're at 70, this is where everybody's going, oh, I got to be long stocks, right? And I'm getting phone calls that why aren't we long AI stocks, right? You know, whatever it is. But this is where everybody wants to buy. At the bottom down here, this is where everybody wants to sell. The first rule of investing is, is to buy when nobody else wants to buy something, sell something when everybody wants to buy it. And right now, think about what everybody doesn't want to own. That's the stuff you should be buying. Think about everything that everybody wants to own. That's probably the stuff you should be selling. And that's generally the way it works more often than not. And it's a great rule to follow. All right, great. Um, so this whole discussion on this chart interrupted your flow to another chart that you wanted to go to. So I want to make sure you get to speak to that. Oh, as well. I just I just wanted to put some context around the rally this year. And again, you know, markets are up, uh, you know, 11, 12 percent year to date. But again, I just want to remind you that this has been this has been a very tough year for every portfolio manager. It's been a tough year for us. It's been a tough year for everybody. And that's because if you run any type of portfolio that all of it is, is more long biased and we're more long biased, not, we do hedge, we do short from time to time as a hedge. But primarily, we're long-term managers, so we're mostly long biased most of the time. Uh, we do hedge risk with you know other instruments, of course. But again, this has been a tough year for for markets in general. Um, and if we take a look at this chart in particular from the first of this year, uh, let me just uh, back up here real quick and uh, we'll just say January of this year. So the, the top chart, the red line is the S&P 500 equal weighted index. Right now, year to date, that index is up 12.47%. The bottom line, the black line is the uh, equal weight index, which is negative 2% year to date. So that massive gap in performance is basically those top seven mega cap stocks or the top 10 mega caps that absorb all the passive inflows. That's Apple, Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, Tesla, Meta, those stocks. That's what's performed this year. That's what's holding the overall index up. You, 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 and even in this, the equal weight index, those same stocks are in there. They just have an equal weight. Um, so you can see that the, the flow, the, the impact of those top 10 market cap weighted stocks have created all of the returns this year in the market versus the other 493 stocks in the index. So for anybody, if you're looking at, don't look at the S&P this year to judge your performance in your portfolio, look at the equal weight index. That is a much better predictor of what your portfolio is probably doing this year. All right, great. We've talked about this. Um, and of course, the big question is, is what's going to happen with flows in the Magnificent Seven going forward? If they continue to gobble up all capital inflows and capital inflows are positive, yeah, they should do fine. Uh, but if they don't, not only will they get hit, they'll take everything down with them. Right. Well, and the question is, is, is why are they going to get hit? What would cause that? And, you know, last year, uh, Fang stocks took a hit through October. And I wrote this, the article in November on November the 4th of uh, 2022 saying, are Fang stocks dead? And I made the case why they aren't because of stock buybacks, because of passive inflows. And that's not going to change. You know, passive inflows have now largely outstripped active inflows into money. And so the more money we keep pouring into ETFs, and in regards to whether you're buying buying them passively, you're just buying an SP index and holding it, or if you're just trading ETFs rather than trading stocks, it's all the same. All that money flows into those stocks. And there's really nothing that suggests that's going to change anytime soon. And so that's going to make these markets a lot more difficult to navigate because a lot of the fundamentals that used to drive markets aren't driving markets anymore. And that's, that's a, a real challenge for people like us that are fundamental investors. Because you're fighting the giant mindless robot of passive capital flows. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, which is one of those things that it just, my worry there, right, is the market just habituates around that and just says, well, all that really matters is what the giant mindless robot's doing. And then everybody jumps on that bandwagon and then it stops working <laughs> and takes everything down with it. 
Oh, you know, that, and that could be that could absolutely be the case. Again, I, you just got to kind of you've got to kind of make the argument of what's going to cause, you know, everybody to sell their app, their, you know, their their technology sector ETF or sell their shares of Apple, Google, Microsoft. You know, what's going to cause that? I mean, you've got to have these companies come in and start, you know, really talking about a downturn in earnings. And, and, and well, really I mean, we could talk about company. shrinking revenues. I mean, that that applies to Apple. You know, I mean, <laughs> oh, it does. It it trees does. don't grow to the moon. Right. At some point, these companies become worth the entire GDP and then there's no more to grow beyond that. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's, it's a, that's a fair statement. And I, I, I don't have the answer for you, Adam, uh, of what's going to cause that massive shift in mindset, because again, it's a wall street product. Uh, that's what wall street promotes. BlackRock is a, a huge promoter of, of their ETFs. It's a, it's a massive inflow for their company. So, um, you know, this push to get more and more people just to invest in ETFs. And again, now, you know, 401k plans, we've got all these fiduciary responsibilities with 401k plans, DO, the, these Department of Labor guidelines where we have to provide the lowest cost product uh, into 401k plans. doesn't matter whether they perform or not. It's just they've got to have the lowest cost. And so that's ETFs. Now they have a lower cost than mutual funds. So we're just pushing more and more people in uh, forcing them, not pushing them. We're forcing them into buying ETFs uh, versus, uh, you know, other, other asset classes. And that's just going to make this potential rotation out of ETFs, even more difficult to fathom. Got it. All right. Well, look, um, we haven't even talked about bonds yet. I want to get there. Uh, but very quickly, I want to get your thoughts on on something that I think is pretty important here, which is um, right now in bond land, right, we're seeing the yield curves starting to uninvert, right? And they're uninverting by a bear steepening, right? So as you said earlier, Lance, um, you know, a yield curve inversion is when the short end of the curve yields are higher than the long end of the curve yields, right? And this is what the Fed's been controlling with its super aggressive uh, rate hike campaign. Um, now, I think most people expected that the curve was going to invert because the Fed was going to pivot and start lowering yields, and those would come back down to be, you know, lower, the, yeah, lower than the long end yields. Instead, what we're seeing is what's called a bear steepening which is the, the yields on the longer end of the curve are coming up to match the high short end, right? And there's there's a lot of damage that that, that can do, right? Steepening of the, the, the further end of the curve um, has, a, has, I think, Alf Pecatiello, when he was on last week, said that that has like 10 times more impact on economic growth than monkeying around with the short end of the curve. Um, but I want to talk for a second about the impact that this is having on the banking system. Um so, you know, banks lend short, sorry, they borrow short and lend long, right? right? So their existing portfolio of loans that they've made by lending long were done back in an era where it was like, you know, rates were like 3%, right? So that's what their income coming in is coming from. When they borrow short now, <laughs> they're borrowing at, you know, north of five, right? So uh, that's hurting their business model, right? Um, now, uh, at the same time, their, their reserve assets, which, you know, were largely made up of safe assets like treasuries, the higher yields go, the, the, the more impaired their current, uh, book balances are, right? So banks are just in this increasing vice as long as, as rates keep going up here. Um, and, uh, where's the stat I had here? Um, unearned losses now at banks uh, look like they're on track to hit a record 700 billion, right? So I guess the question is, is as long as this higher for longer keeps going on, and let's let let's assume for a moment that you know the Jamie Dimon war warnings, you know maybe come to to pass where we start seeing you know Fed funds rate above six percent or maybe even higher, like how worried do we need to be about another big breakage in the banking system right now? Because everyone seems to sort of forgotten about it. Yeah, there was some worry, you know, back at the beginning of the year, but, but now everything seems fine, right? Is it really fine? Or are we kind of dancing around the rim of the volcano here? Well, I don't know if we're dancing around the rim of the volcano. Let's not be overly dramatic. But uh, you know, we certainly haven't resolved the banking crisis issue. You know, right after the the regional bank crisis, we bought two, we bought small trading positions in two little regional banks, uh, PNC and Truist Financial. Um, we actually sold Truist Financial today and actually bought more of our bond position today on that trade uh, simply because we're worried about these higher rates 
on earnings. So when these we, when these banks report earnings, um, they're going to show much bigger capital losses because of these higher rates. Now they're getting they they still have the support of the uh, bank term funding program that's that's keeping them out of uh, out of failure. But these capital losses are certainly going to weigh on their overall earnings outlook and forecast. And so uh, technically, uh, Truist hasn't been performing as well as we've liked. So we took that risk off the table. We, we still like the company very much, has almost an 8% yield on it. Um, we're going to come back to it um, you know, once it kind of stabilizes a bit and finds a bottom. Um, but PNC we're holding on to right now. It's been performing much better. Um, but again, yeah, there's a real worry in the banking sector. Again, I, uh, in fact, PNC is the only financial we own other than Visa uh, right now, because going into earnings season, we're very aware of that potential risk in their in their balance sheet. But, you know, the higher bond yields are, are going to weigh on, you know, every company uh, and they're going to weigh on the economy and everything else. So, again, you know, we're we're fast approaching that point to where we see a potential financial event of some sort. And again, whenever you've had rates as high as they are now, uh, either the Fed or on the 10-year Treasury, you've always had some type of financial event, uh, some type of economic event or a recession uh, every single time. And again, that was even in 1995. The Fed was hiking rates. You had the Russian debt default. You had a long-term capital management blow up. Um, and then we had the recession So and the dot-com crash. So there is no escaping that you're eventually going to have an event. That Now, again, that doesn't mean go get your Patriot food supply today and, and hunker down in your bunker. That's not what that means. It just means that we're going to have some trouble in the economy because of higher rates. Does that mean lower asset prices? Yeah, but that's going to be a buying opportunity, not a selling opportunity. So it's always important to keep your psychological perspective correct. All right. So first off, you're making my you know perennial lag effect warning here, which I'm glad you are. So I'm still yeah. waving that flag, right? Lag effect matters. It's going to come into play. Um, but I want to I want to stick on this question though about the banks for a moment. And the reason why is because my thesis, that's the that that that's number one on the Fed's priority list. Right. Oh, there, there's, oh, there, there, there's a lot of damage that I think the Fed could let the economy and the markets take here. Um because it's playing for credibility. This is this is the Al Pecatiello theory, right? Which is the Fed's playing for for its credibility here. And um until and unless it gets inflation under you know, to its two percent target, um, it's gonna stay higher for longer, even if the markets start selling off here and the economy starts struggling, um, until the world comes to the Fed on bended knee and says, please, we know you're trying to get your two percent inflation target, but we're just begging you please intervene. And that'll give the Fed the political air cover to, to, to come into play and, and fix things. Yeah. But I, my, my, my addition to that is, but if the banking system starts faltering, that's when the Fed says, all right, screw everything else. We got to save the banks. And that's because the Fed is a confederation of banks and it exists for the benefit of the banking system. Well, and, and but also too, don't forget the banking system, the credit system is the lifeblood of the economy. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, he's absolutely right in the statement that Look, the market's down 7% from the peak, right? Come on, right? 7%. Everybody's like freaking out like we're going into a bear market or something. Right. something. Like we're having a correction, something we talked about back in June, 3 to 5 to 10%, where it's 7. It's not the end of the world. And it's something the Fed actually likes, right? They love this negative sentiment because, again, that's helping feed into this narrative of slowing down consumer spending, bringing down inflation. We just saw a big drop in gasoline prices, not saying that's correlated, but you know, that's what they want to see. They want to, they're, they're sitting back going, yeah, this is good. This is exactly what we want. Higher for longer is kind of keeping the market under control, not getting out, out, of, out of hand here. Because again, as we said before, what they don't want is a raging stock market because that boosts consumer confidence, that fuels inflation. So they're okay with this. They're not okay with 20, 25%. Um, you know, back in 2018, the Fed's hiking rates were nowhere near neutral in September. By December, we're down 20%. Trump's all over Jerome Powell. Remember, we all believe that Jerome Powell was this different animal. But as soon as right. Trump brought him, he's like, oh, well, maybe we are close to the neutral rate after all. By June, we cut rates to zero. By September, we're doing a massive repo program that we didn't know at the time, but we were bailing out Citadel and head, head, other hedge funds uh, at that point. We didn't know until the end of the year. We had alarm bells ringing across the board in September and October. And in March, we're in a recession. So, you know, 
It, it takes time. These inversions of yield curves generally occur two years in advance of recession. We're about 18 months into this one. So again, you know, it's probably coming. It's probably next year. And the Fed's just trying to buy as much time as they can. They don't care about little corrections in the market. That's fine. They need to buy as much time as they can without a bank blowing up. Yeah. Okay. Without a bank blowing up. Okay. And that, that, that's my whole point. So I guess just before we leave this topic, how can, which your level of concern right now, let's say on a scale of one to 10, 10 being super concerned about the integrity of the banking system uh, under the current yield regime? Oh, it's, it's, you know, uh, it's always interesting, right? Credit Suisse, which just got bought out by UBS because they were failing just past all of their Fed stress tests. So <laughs> that was the quality of the Fed stress test. Um, look, you know, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they're fine, right? Tons of capital, they're okay. Uh, I wouldn't go panic on that. Um, the regional banks and particularly the very small regional banks are where the risks are right now because of their commercial real estate exposure. Yep. And that's not, that's not getting any better. So, you know, if, the, if you want to go back in history, go, okay, well, what type of financial crisis are we going to have in the banking market? I would say, and again, totally different environment uh, than we had in 1989 with the, with the SNL crisis. There was a bunch of shenanigans going on with that. But, you know, you could see a financial problem within these small and regional banks. Again, another reason we, we took TFC off the board for right now, uh, just to hedge that risk. Uh, but, but that's where I think you're going to see the risk pop up. It won't, you know, it won't be J.P. Morgan on the ropes. It's going to be multiple regional banks on the ropes that create a bigger problem because there'll be too many for J.P. Morgan to eat them all up. Okay, right? got it. All right, got to move on from this. Still a super interesting topic. I do want to let folks know that um, I mentioned was it a week ago, two weeks ago, that I was in talks with one of the co-founders of Long Term Capital Management. Um, it did happen to land him, uh, Victor Hagani. Uh, I'll be interviewing him next week. So keep your eye out for that interview. Sure to be very interesting. Um, all right. So now last big topic, Lance, bonds. Um, yep. So uh, I guess just tell us what we need to know about what's going on in bonds right now. Um, specifically, you wrote a recent piece, um, fund flows versus bond yields, kind of right. like which matters more here. So what were your conclusions? Well, just basically, you know, you've got so two things that drive, you know, bond yields. And again, we, we you know, kind of get, you know, kind of sidelined with kind of all the, the headlines out there and everything else. But ultimately, you've got two things that drive bonds, right? You have flows into bonds um, and then you have the uh, yield itself, which can be driven by different factors uh, accordingly. And one of the things that we're noting is, is that you know, despite you've got record flows going into bonds right now, you have such a massive shorting of bonds by these, you know, these CTAs, these computerized algorithms, et cetera. They're shorting these bonds so heavily that it's driving yields up. And they're going to keep shorting these bonds as long as prices are going down and yields are going up. But that is a massive fuel for a reversal in bond yields and bond prices when that when that turns because when something happens and whatever causes that turn as soon as those CTAs start racking up enough losses on a reversal they're going to start covering all those shorts which is a massive amount of buying that has to come in to to buy that to buy that debt that's sitting out there so they've got to find people willing to sell them the debt at that point but nobody's going to want to sell them the debt so that's going to drive yields lower, faster, and prices higher, trying to find buyers willing to let go of 5% coupon bonds. They're just not going to want to do that in this environment. I'm not, I don't want to sell it. So there's a real conundrum coming up between this massive short position. And, and, and again, you, know, you take a look at fund flows into TLT. They're hitting records right now. So a lot of investors uh, are, are catching on to the idea of what's going on here. And they're getting ahead of this curve that when this thing turns, and you have to be patient, um, but when this thing turns, it's going to be pretty explosive. And, and that's why today, so uh, I want to be really, really clear about what I'm about to say. So we run a model. It's a live account that is, is a, it's an actual live account on Simplevisor that we run. And it's, a, it's an exact model of what we do for our clients. And so whatever we do in that model on Simplevisor is what we're doing for our clients with the exception of today. And the reason today is different is because recently we sold our TLT position and for all of our clients and bought a 10-year 
uh, sorry, a 20 year treasury bond in its place. Well, because Simplevisor doesn't have access to daily pricing on specific treasury issues, I used, I, I did a swap of TLT to, ED, to EDV, which is the Vanguard Extended Duration Bond ETF. So I actually have an ETF in the Simplevisor model that is unlike what I have with client accounts that, are, that own the actual long treasury itself. Today, we're doing a trading position in EDV. This morning at the open, I increased our EDV position in that portfolio this morning for a trade. So I'm looking for a short-term reflexive bounce in yields over the next couple of months, maybe into December. Then I'll sell that new position and bring it back down to the same weight as our clients. But um, it's, that's hard to do with actual treasury bonds. So I'm only doing it in the Simplivisor model. So I just want to be really clear. This is a one-off trade that I'm doing, not doing for clients, but doing on the Simplivisor trading platform because I think there's the, the deviation of price from the 200-day moving average is the largest on record. That cannot last for very long. You're going to get a reversion in price back to the 200-day moving average at some point. It can take a while. Like I said, it can take a couple of months. But so we're adding to this uh, trading position in the short term. Again, then the other side of that is we sold TFT, uh, TFC, uh, Truist Financial, to reduce our equity risk. Um, we also added a bit to our utility sector. We own Duke Energy. Um, we we added to that position earlier in the week um, because we're already starting to see flows back into utilities on the expectation that yields are going to start to come down as well. So we're starting to see some evidence that we're getting to the point of that curve. We're about to start seeing a reversion in yields. Okay. Um, super important. Uh, if, if you can, while I'm talking, if you can pull up a chart of TLT on your system, that's easy to do. Yeah. Um, and I just want, I just want to clarify. So, uh, hey, hey, thanks for clarifying for everybody the what you're doing. We kind of got into your trades part of the discussion here. So, so it sounds like you just shared all your trades. But if there are more trades you did this week. Uh, no, that's it. Something. That's it. OK. Um, but uh, I just want to make sure and, and thanks for clarifying, you know, how Simplevisor is somewhat deviating a little bit from what you're doing for actual clients for the reporting reasons that you talked about. Um you made one comment, which I I, I want to make sure I understand because I, I think maybe it was a misspeak. You said you were buying the EDV because you were expecting a bounce in yields. I don't think you're expecting a, a bounce, bounce in yields. Price. Bounce in price. Yeah, yeah you expect yields <laughs> yeah. to come down. Okay, good. Just wanted <laughs> to make sure folks didn't get confused by that. No, no, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, when you're trying to talk off the top of your head, sometimes you, it's easy to misspeak on something. So yeah, um, but yeah, here's here's a chart of TLT for you. Okay, um, and I just want to. Yeah. Okay. This is what I thought it was going to be. Um, so you can see the extremity of the recent sell-off, right? Way below the 200-day moving average. Folks that have been owning TLT and watching this have been feeling like their faces have been melting off. Totally get it. Um, but you look at the, certainly at the RSI, right? We're kind of out of the range there down on the extremely oversold level. Um, and we're definitely at, at quite low oversold readings on the MACD up there above. So, you know, going back to the discussion we had about the S&P, you talk about these things as, as sort of like rubber bands, right? When, you, when you, you get to the extreme end of the range, it's like yep. the rubber band getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So you're basically saying you just expect, even just from a technical standpoint alone, some sort of extreme snapback. Yeah. Well, again, here's, here's uh, you know, last October, uh, we were at 91.11 on TLT, very similar oversold condition on uh, the RSI. And TLT went from 91 to basically about 110 over the course of the next couple of months. So, you know, that's about a 20% advance um, in TLT over a very short period of time. And, you know, that kind of, of you know, pickup, certainly don't mind adding. Uh, again, you know, when we go back in history, whenever you've had these deep deviations uh, from the 200-day moving average, you always have a reversal. So again, just you know, it's worth you know taking a look. Here's another you know uh, situation where uh, this was in uh, March of 2021, very deeply oversold relative to to the index and to the 200-day moving average, and of course, uh, you know, very very strong advance following that. So again, just you know, we've got that same technical. So this is strictly a technical trade. This has nothing to do with fundamentals or economics or anything else. This is just a price deviation technical trade that I think will play out over the next three to five months. Okay, great. 
Thanks for pulling that up. Um, we did just go through your trades, so that's ticked off for the list. So I'm going to start wrapping it up here, Lance, and I want to thank you again for giving us so much time after the 40 minutes that uh, we talked where I realized we didn't have the recorder on. Uh, total rookie mistake. Fortunately, I think that's the first time I've done that to you in yeah. the year and a half we've been doing this, but I'll commit it'll be the last. Um, real quick before we go, um, just your 60 seconds, because I know you wrote a piece about this. Uh, looks like we talked about you know what could happen with a government shutdown last week. Looks like that's been averted. Uh, interestingly, it looks like the, you know, Kevin McCarthy, the speaker that kind of came to that agreement has now lost his job as a result of that. Um, but uh, what implications of the, the 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 avoidance of the government shutdown, if any, do you expect there to be? Well, I mean, look, the, the bottom line is these government shutdowns are, are are not bad. You know, we talk about recessions. They're like a forest. Fire. Look, forest fires are terrible, right? We, you have Mount California. They're terrible events. But they're not bad, actually, you know, for the forest, because, you know, when you don't have good forest management, you have a lot of, uh, of, of leaves and brush that get built up, you know, uh, on the ground. It, it helps. It, it constricts growth. So a forest fire clears all that out. It fertilizes the soil with the ash and, and then you get a whole bunch of new growth. It's a terrible event, but it leads to a better economic outcome, a better outcome for the forest. And the same thing for government shutdowns. It's the same thing for economic recessions. We shouldn't be so opposed to them. They're terrible things, but we shouldn't be opposed to them. The problem with these continuing resolutions, and we haven't had one, we haven't had a budget since uh, President Obama took office. We've been doing these continuing resolutions. And the reason that we have this explosion in debt is because we're compounding the rate of spending at 8% every single year. So when we do a continuing resolution, it says, okay, what was the spending last year? Okay, that's the spending this year plus 8%. And so we get, this is why debt's just exploding through the roof and spending. We now spend 113% of our revenue just to cover mandatory spending, which is Social Security, welfare, and interest on the debt. Everything else that wants to get paid for, defense, Department of Education, parks and recreation, all that, that's all debt issued. So it's just we don't have any revenue to cover any of that. So we've got to get back in, 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 into the point of saying we've got to have a budget. We've got to stop these continuing resolutions. And if it requires a government shutdown that lasts three months, four months, five months, whatever it is, it's going to be a, it'll be a drag on economic growth. People are going to be out of a job. I'm sorry. But at least you start getting back to some type of normal functioning in Washington where people have to debate over a spending bill, create the funding for it, justify it, and then put that money to work. OK. All right. Have to leave it there. Uh Okay, I had, had, had some data on the weakening consumer. I'm going to punt to next week, um, except just to share this headline. Uh, it just came out in Bloomberg. Nearly half of all young adults live with mom and dad. The share of people in the U.S. ages 18 to 29 who are living with family is now at the same level as it was back in the 1940s. Um, not my household. <laughs> not in your household. Uh, and interesting, not so much in mine. Um, but, uh, you know, Keep talking about strong, resilient consumer, all that type of stuff. Um, definitely seeing lots of lots of signs that the consumer is weakening at all ends of the spectrum. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about that again will punt uh, to a future discussion is I was at Vid Summit uh, this week. Just got back from it actually. Vid Summit is the annual gathering of YouTube content creators. Really fascinating experience. Um, I, I just did a surgical kind of day in day out. It's a multi day event. Um, but uh, just the two quick things I'll flag here for folks. One is uh, I went there last year for the first time and I was total unknown, right? D didn't know anybody there. Nobody knew me. Um, this time around, uh, I was stopped en enough. I'm not saying I, it was the bell of the ball by any stretch, but uh, I would say there was probably at least a half dozen to dozen people over the, the time I was there that came up and said, hey, really love what you're doing at Wealthion, big fan of Wealthion. Um, so I just want to let folks know that Wealthion is it's on the map uh, with these guys. It, it, it's not the biggest city by any stretch, but it actually is on the radar of the YouTube content creator community and the folks that operate in that ecosystem. And I attribute that to all the great guests we have on this channel, your weekly commitment to this, Lance, everybody else who's watching here, um, it, 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 uh, it, it was really, it was a great feeling to know that, you know, what we're doing here is beginning to get recognized. And, you know, 
there's some of these people in this community, not the ones coming up to me, but you know, some of these people in this community, I mean, they've got hundreds of millions of, of uh, followers. And the fact that, that anybody in this ecosystem kind of has recognized what we're doing and follows it, really pretty impressive. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention, this is just, just to a poll. So folks, let me know in the comments what you think. Um, but I was it, talking with a guy there who um, his company does a lot of things for YouTube creators. But one of the things they do is they their specialty is, you know, finding the, the meteoric stars, right? The, 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 the channel that's going from, you know, 50,000 views to 50 million, right, subscribers. Um, and uh, when they find somebody like that, by the way, folks, that's not me right now with Wealthion, but when they find somebody like that, um, they'll go up to them and say, look, you know, we can invest in your channel and help you grow and catalyze your growth. Um, and so they're sort of like a, an angel firm, a VC firm, a private equity firm that is basically identifying, you know, tomorrow's next massive YouTube star and, you know, helping that person achieve that outcome, but also getting a, you know, getting equity in, in, in their operation. Um, and, you know, as we were talking and I learned more about his model, I said, gosh, you know, I've got a bunch of investors on this channel who are always looking for alternative forms of investment. Would you guys ever, you know, do you ever need additional capital for these things? And he said, absolutely. We syndicate every deal. So anyways, folks, if there's any interest amongst any of you in maybe having me you know, bring these guys on to tell you kind of what they do and, and explain their model to you, um, I could do that. But I don't want to do it unless you guys are interested in it. So if you are, let me know in the comments section below. And if there's enough interest, I'll bring those guys on. Um, all right. Really important uh, announcement here for folks, which is that uh, Wealthion's Fall Conference is coming up just two weeks away. If you're watching this the day this video releases on Saturday, uh, you only have 24 hours before the early bird price discount expires at midnight on Sunday. So if you haven't registered and you've been meaning to, go register now to lock in that lowest price discount of 29% for the early birds. Of course, if you're an alumnus, uh, check your email because you get uh, a code from me that gives you an additional 15% discount off of that. If you're watching this video on Sunday, you only have a couple hours left. So get going. Um, and to do that, just go to wealthion.com slash conference. It's got all the details there. And that's where you register and lock in those prices. Uh, and just as a quick reminder, too, if you can't watch the event fully live or, or live at all, on Saturday, October 21st, don't worry, everybody who registers are getting replay videos of the whole thing. Um, and as we do every week, remind everybody that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty ahead as Lance and I have been talking about this whole uh, discussion. So we recommend that you navigate it under the help of a good financial advisor who understands all the macro issues that Lance and I have talked about here. If you've got a good one who's doing that for you, great, stick with them. But if you don't, consider having a free consultation with one that does, maybe even Lance himself and his team there at RAA. To do that, just go to Wealthion dot com fill out the short form there doesn't cost you anything no commitment to work with these guys just a free public service that they offer um lance thanks buddy it's been wonderful folks if uh if if the the best part of your weekends no matter what else happens is listening to this conversation week after week after week uh please let lance know how much you appreciate him uh and his just existing in this world uh, by hitting the like button and then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Lance, buddy, you get the last word as usual. Nope, uh, look, I have no idea what's going to happen next, but uh, we'll talk about it next Friday. All right. Thanks so much, buddy. Again, thanks for soldiering through the stupid uh, not having the record button on. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.